It's so good to have a local guy with an accent, y'all, to introduce you when you're down here. Uh, good morning, you guys. I'm Chase. I was thinking as I was walking the Austin streets the last couple of days, as I was freezing my ass off, was that the coldest weather ever in Austin's history? Okay. Well, it, it took me to a place where I was about a year ago climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. It might be hard to see the similarities there. Austin, Mount Kilimanjaro. Let's just base it on the temperature because I was frozen. Um, but I went there uh, with some good friends to, to climb Mount Kilimanjaro and raise awareness for water. Turns out that there's more than a billion people every day who go without access to clean water. Uh, it's the number one cause of death and disease. Uh, so I went there with some friends, uh, Bryn Muser, actually some, some friends you may know. Um, Let's see, Mark Foster from Foster the People. I think he's going to be here this week. Bryn Mooser took the stage a couple days ago. Um, a handful of folks who have large social followings. And the goal was to climb the mountain and raise awareness uh, about the access to clean drinking water. And while I was on that walk, it's about a five-day walk up to 19,200 square feet. And on that walk, I had a lot of time to do some thinking. I was reflecting on how powerful the the sentiment of not having clean water is. Uh, and it occurred to me that what we were doing was a very creative way of drawing attention to something. Here we were, a bunch of guys and gals on the side of a mountain in Africa. And our hope was to spread through large social following the mission and had to get back to the, to, uh, to the rest of the people and then hopefully uh, fall on some ears that could help. Lo and behold, it did. Um, Bana got involved. and then it made its way to the president. So it was a creative approach to connecting a water issue with the president of the United States in hopes of being able to do something about it. Also on that walk, uh, there was this incredible technology that made it possible for us to get to the summit. Little packets of, wa of uh, just little white packets. I was told they were one or two cents each. And what it would allow you to do is go to the, take a bucket, go to the stream, a five gallon bucket, pour this packet in there. And I'm telling you, this, this water was muddy. It was just brown mud water. And through the course of about five minutes of stirring, the mud would all coagulate and sink to the bottom. Then you could pour that through cheesecloth or a, a clean piece of cotton, a t-shirt, into another bucket, let it sit for a minute, and then you'd have clean drinking water. And I know the process of making that packet was a P&G product, incredibly innovative. Didn't require digging wells, didn't require airlift, helicopters required nothing but a little packet and a stick and a bucket. That was an incredibly creative solution to a lack of drinking water. And this is the process actually, I don't know if you can see that, that's actually stirring that bucket. And as I was walking, you gotta do a lot of walking, it's like a six day walk up to 19,200 feet. And you're very much alone. This is me about uh, three in the morning on summit day. There's no lights up there. There's no fast food or anything. Um, and I got to thinking about how creative those solutions were. And it, and it hit me, it was an aha moment that creativity is actually the thing that solves all problems. Not just some problems, all problems. It solves, it's going to solve the water crisis. It's going to solve the humanitarian crisis. It's going to solve flying cars. It's going to solve all these problems and it's creativity. But the real problem then is that we are actually living in a culture and we have an educational system that does not prioritize, that does not cultivate creativity. In fact, it stamps it out. And that's a huge worry for me. Um, the solution then is to change the system. And changing the system is so much what, what South By is about, bringing people together, smart people, thoughtful people, people who want to instigate change, people who stand for change. So my proposal is that we start thinking about creativity being the new literacy. Now, let's go back to literacy for a second. Literacy, uh, well, pre-literacy, as, as a, my by and large, there, it was reserved for clergy, for the, the wealthy, it was reserved for um, royalty, the very, very, very few. And then this thing came along called the printing press, 
We don't need to like fight over who invented it, but it came along in about the 1400s. And what did we see? We saw an explosion of human knowledge after that. So a little piece of technology plus a decision to actually program for knowledge acquisition and program for we saw that once people were literate, disease went away, not entirely, but was dramatically reduced. We saw um, art explode. We saw all kinds of things take off because information was allowed to spread in a way that had never been done before. Well, what I'm positing today that we think of creativity in the same fashion, because right now, the way we think of creativity, we're incredibly literate, but our vision of creativity is very much medieval. This has got to change. We must think of creativity on the same stage as we do um, literacy. So what does this mean? We have to, we have to all, everything's analogous. We have to then take the same stuff. We can be pre, let's say we're sort of pre-creativity right now. We're gonna prioritize creativity. We're gonna apply some technology. Technology being information sharing. And we're gonna start valuing this stuff as a culture. Oops, that was back. I meant to, be, meant to go forward. So this is like a three-act play, and bear with me here. Act one, let's talk about what, what is creativity, because there's a lot of, like, it's a, there's a, it's a pie in the sky term. It's a term that gets thrown around a lot. It is start with nothing and then end up with something that something ideally is meaningful, okay? It has, it has use. That's a messy process, though, the creative process. You've heard about that. Um, it usually involves sort of tinkering with something for a while, and you don't just you know, have the perfect idea and it comes out of your head fully formed. There's tinkering involved, and it's often related to taking a counter stance. It's like reinventing something, something that wasn't what it was before, and making it into something new. And certainly not art. This, I mean, not just art. This is very creative, obviously. Michelangelo, you've seen uh, Ansel Adams, very, very creative photos. Music of the Beatles, incredibly creative. There's no real doubt here. So we can say, without doubt, that art is but a subset of creativity. It's down here. But there's this, this idea that that is where creativity stops is one of the things that I'm trying to change. That's, if I walk out of here and have done one thing, and that's it, then I will feel like I've done something. So let's look at some other things that I consider to be incredibly creative. Martin Luther King's approach to human rights, incredibly creative. Felix Baumgartner taking a pod up into the sky and jumping out of a balloon and doing something no one had ever been done in the history of man. Incredibly creative. Turning brick into a wheel. That's a creative process. That's creativity applied to mechanical engineering. The light bulb is creativity applied to electrical engineering. Even E equals MC squared is theoretical science and creativity coming together. This guy said it best. Imagination is greater than knowledge. Imagination is infinite and encircles the world. So bear with me here, show of hands. Who at some point in their life was told to do something practical, do something that's worthwhile, and st was steered away from some soft art stuff? Show of hands, please. Not just this, but who was actively steered away from doing, to, or st steered toward doing something creative? I'm, I'm going to guess that that was like 90% of the room. 90% of the people are saying, you shouldn't do that. You should do this over here because it's very practical. And, and most of you are thinking, oh, I'm this brain kind of person. I'm a that brain kind of person. Just to let you know, that's all bullshit. <laughs> like, literally, the neuroscience says it's bullshit. You're actually not hired, hardwired for one kind of thing or another. It's just fundamentally not true. So there's this guy named Mark Runco at the University of Georgia did this study to prove exactly this. He, was, he went on the campus, he's like, what are the two groups that are polar opposite? He took engineers, like electrical engineers, like bridge people, people that are like making bridges, and then he took the musicians, and he put them through a competency test about just testing creativity, some things as an indicator of, of the, the level of creativity, because we all agree that there is probably a spectrum, but you're not either creative or not. What did he find? You're right here, you already know what he found. He found that there was no difference in the creative abilities between engineers and musicians. I, you know, traditional thought would have thought that the musicians were wildly creative and the engineers not. It's just not true. So creativity, we, we've said what it is, what it is, and now it's expressly not the output of some sort of 
ele elite group of people who've got special access to some knowledge. In fact, John Cleese said it great, creativity is not a talent, it's a way of operating. Who is creative? You is creative. I know, it's a funny joke, isn't it? Um, but really, every single person in this room, and, I, and there, knowing how many people's hands were raised, I'm sure of that, let's just take the, if 90% of the people were told at some time that you weren't or that you should be doing something that wasn't creative, I may, half of you right now don't believe me, or half of you are thinking, yeah, yeah, but that's just not me, dude, I'm not into it. You might not like the idea, but you certainly have every element in, within you. Act two of this three-act play is shit is broken. Just straight up. Um, because this, this idea of creativity being everywhere and every person having it is just not spoken of. It's not, it's not pop culture. We clearly don't say it. We clearly don't value it based on our actions. Uh, you saw earlier from that show of hands that discouraging creativity is actually very, very popular. That's something that hurts. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my story. This is me at age 25. Uh, no, this, this is me at age 24. Um, no, all right, this is me as a child. I'm, I'm somewhere in the two range here. Um, just not giving an F right here, right? Just rolling. And I was, I, I remember having um, entire plays in and around my rocking horse there where I would ride over here, I would get this stuffed animal, put him on my back and ride back and save the, it would be safe to say I was riding bareback. Um, but I had an imagination and it was relentless. And I think you guys feel the same. This is the first film I ever directed as a photographer and a filmmaker. It was, I mean, it's clearly, the cinematography is insane, it's beautiful. Um, so what just happened right there, we met with the bad guys, I got stabbed. There's the princess, she's looking for the, you know, I don't know what she's looking for there. Um, that's me, that's my, my two homies. They went out to avenge my injury. There's obviously the bad guy. He's got a pirate hat on. They stab him. And then he was defending the, uh, the, the princess, so they got to then go rage the castle, grab the princess, bring them back to our fort, where the queen and the princess were united. We put our swords together, and we run off up Brock Zilsta's driveway. <laughs> I'll happily take a round of applause for that, being my first film. All right. We, we then, we then um, screened that film. You know, the way we were able to make that film uh, was we washed cars for a week, we made enough money, then we bought the, a couple of six minute reels of eight millimeter film, and then we screened it by doing the same thing. A couple months later, we washed a bunch of cars, went out and bought a bunch of candy, and I started to get this entrepreneurial thing going on. Sold out show, 16 people. It was awesome. Actual cardboard. I'm in the 10, 12 range here, breakdancing. You see this sort of relentless expression, relentless um, bits of creativity. Here, junior high, starting to feel like a little bit of a punk, but we're listening to our own music. We're combining athletics and expression through skateboarding, skateboarding graphics, spray painting, actual movement being incredibly creative. And then, there's this pattern in culture that happens to almost everybody. It happened to me. I will put an asterisk there. I narrowly escaped it, but I was a victim of the system, which is all that shit is extinguished. Somewhere in about in, in junior high, we let the, the, the anti-creativity programming begin. It's really depressing to me. Uh, I, I escaped, I'll tell you how I escaped in the um, in the third act, but what we need to ask is we need, what, why is this happening? What's happening? Why are our most creative little people, who are all quite creative, you've all, you, those of you who have kids at home, you watch them say shit that you have no idea what they're saying, they're making stuff up, they're cool with it. What, what's wrong when we stop them from, from doing that? We have to change something. Well, part of the reason that that exists is because this is also sort of a frustration for me, that literally the school year is based on a 19th century idea of the farm. We do not learn less effectively between June and September. It is because we are supposed to be out picking the crops. 
literally. I know a couple farmers, but they don't need that much help. <laughs> We're th our educational system is based on an idea that was a 19th century idea. The same is true for the factory. In the Industrial Revolutions, when factories cropped up, we started adopting our schools to look like a factory because we saw how efficient a factory is. A factory, you took raw material, you put it in one end, and then you just slowly crank through it. And over the course of about 12 years, you made everything. What, what comes out of the end of a factory? A bunch of shit that looks like the other shit. Okay? You put raw material in the front end, and then it moves through the system. We can put it on a conveyor belt at the same speed. If something doesn't move the same speed, we take it off the conveyor belt, we try and fix it really quick, and then we run back ahead and we stuff it back in the system so that it stays on time. That is what our educational system is based on, the farm and the factory. That is no way to create a culture of creative people. If we want a creative society, if we want an innovative society, then we need an educational system and paths themselves that are creative and innovative. Does anyone agree with that? That's nice to hear. But what can we do about it, you guys? This is the part that kills me. I'm gonna keep ranting here for a second since I'm on a roll. I picked this up. Uh, the first time I was impassioned to give this sort of talk, normally as an artist I stand up here and show pictures and people go, oh, oh, and everyone leaves feeling great. I'm sort of blowing that right now, but when it was front page USA Today last year, I think January or July 1st or 2nd. $1.1 trillion in debt, in student debt. It's greater than credit card debt. Seriously, greater than credit card debt. That's nuts. This 31% right now, that's the number of people increased over the last year who are applying for student loans. This number 27,547, that was the number of average student debt graduating in, I think that was 2012. 2013 and 14, $35,200 is the average student debt. That means for everybody who graduates with $10,000 in student debt, there's someone who graduates, help me with this real quick math, $50,000 in student debt. There's a lot of people who attribute this as the fundamental reason that our economic system is hosed. Because when you graduate with this much debt, or $50,000, or $60,000, or if you go to a fancy private school, a hundred grand, you're in the hole, is the first thing you're gonna do, put money back into the economy? Absolutely not. Now, I'm not a rabid uh, you know, consumerist, that's not my plan, but my belief is that this is a broken system. There's something else that's happening too with this. We've got this narrative, which is total horseshit. This narrative that if you go to school, then you might be able to get into a good college. If you go to college and if you get good grades, then you're gonna get a good job. That narrative is false. Who in this room, by show of hands, graduated college and got a job in the thing that they took their degree in? I put that at about a third. That's about what statistics say, too. So we're clearly screwed up on the economics. We're clearly screwed up on prioritizing creativity. And yet, the number one, that's a sweet foam finger, the number one criteria that when 1,500 CEOs were, were surveyed, the number one criteria for leadership that they sought after was creativity. Not number 10, not in the top 10%, not number 20, number one. So why aren't we doing anything about it? 67% of millennials who are employed, they want to be in a creative career, and yet 75% of people feel creatively not at their potential. I'm, I'm starting to, to create a little bit of a, a pattern here, and I hope you can see it. So the question is, Chase, then what are we gonna do about it? I know how much you love lists, you guys. I'm gonna give you 10 things, like a little literal takeaway, a toolkit, 10 things that you can do, not just to help your own creativity, but to help the creativity of our culture, because we have to move things. We've talked about it. We have to move things from here to here. Thing one, I do like that GIF. That's a nice one. Pursue creative craft. Do you even know what that means? I'm gonna tell you, because it means take a picture I think my phone's here. 
I think everybody's got one of these in their pocket. If not everybody, damn near everybody. You can take a picture. Taking a picture every day is a creative act. By the simple, the science backs me on this. By literally doing something creative every day, you are becoming more creative. My mom is a great example. There's my mom and my aunt. She was told her whole life that she was not creative. You know that we had that show of hands earlier. She was told her whole life that she wasn't creative. And in 2009, uh, I got her an iPhone. I put her that, that iPad or that iPhone app that I created, and I put that in her hands. And she started taking pictures every day. And she went in a matter of not years, not decades, but in a matter of weeks, went from being not creative to being the most creative of all her friends. She was getting phone calls, I'm like, oh my gosh, are you taking classes? What's happening? This is, I love your Facebook feed. You're, you're so creative, Joy. You just, you're, you're reborn. I watched that trickle into the other parts of her life. She was traveling all over the place. She was cooking again. She started doing all kinds of stuff just from the simple act of taking a picture every day when she walked and sharing on Facebook. Pick up a creative craft. I do not care if that craft is needlepoint. I don't care if it is sewing. I don't care if it's, um, what do you like again? Um, erotic dance. What, what, he's, he's like, whatever the craft is, pick something up. Make it a habit. Number nine out of ten. You need some space. I didn't see too much like crazy, like people making stuff in the middle of South by. I saw South by. Well, it was very. Uh, There's a lot of people drinking for one thing. But creativity doesn't actually happen in the mayhem. You have to sample the mayhem. You have to get in and mix it up and live a little bit. Live, live a little bit. You have to mix up your life. But that's input. That's not synthesis. Synthesis happens when you have a little bit of space. So put yourself in. Live a, live a, a great life. And then extract yourself. Extraction doesn't have to be moving to Africa or moving to Paris and smoking cigarettes. That's not how you become creative. Just take your time. Take a, take a walk every morning. Take a picture while you're on that walk. Just give yourself a little solace. My man Austin Kleon right there, he meditates in the morning. And then he sits down and he goes to work, unless you've changed your habits. Give yourself a little bit of space. Number eight, play. That's my wife, Kate. She doesn't normally look like that, but this is us on a motorcycle in Greece. I don't know if you uh, saw Charlie Hone. Do you guys know Charlie? He, he ran support for Tim, for Tim Ferriss for a long time, helped Tim launch one of his recent books. The guy basically went through a nervous breakdown because he was working so hard, 24-7, all the time, charging super hard. He just wrote this book called Play, which if you haven't picked it up, it's fantastic. And the, the main premise is this, that if you can set aside even just 30 minutes of surprise and delight for yourself of play, what Charlie talked about doing in the book was he went and played home run derby a couple days a week with his buddies. Just got outside for 30 minutes, exercised, and it wasn't vigorous exercise, that he was infinitely happier. The same, same goes for creativity. If you can get away and exercise and play and do something that's not sitting at your desk every day, you will be more creative, I promise. Number, number seven is find a tribe. South by Southwest is a tribe. I heard so many people talking last night, the night before when I could hear through my drunken blur that this was a great, they found their tribe. It's sort of like Burning Man, but in Austin with better food. <laughs> if this is your tribe or your tribe is the 10 people that you get together with uh, on a regular basis to your reading group, if, if it's your photography club, you need to have other people like you to swap ideas, to get inspired. And you also need a little group to share with. We'll talk about that in a second. Who is your tribe? Your tribe doesn't have to be your best friend. In fact, that might not be the best. Think of other people, other like-minded people who want to do the same creative craft as you do. Number six, show your work. This is the book cover. His first book was Steal Like an Artist, so I stole this cover. How about that? But literally, showing your work, that's one of the reasons I want you to have a tribe. By showing your work, you get, you, you, you tighten up your community, you get feedback, it puts you in, it's sort of like finding a gym partner, right? Find someone you're going to go and do this with. And if you can show your work, you're going to get feedback. Your work's going to get better. Just the simple act of realizing that you're going to show your work might even make you approach it in a different way. This is a fun one. Imperfection. There's been, there's, there's 
for our culture, you know, you could you saw in the 50s with Beaver Cleaver and whatnot, everything had to be perfect. And what we found out a couple years later was all that shit was fake. Everyone wanted to punch each other out. 50s was a rough time. Imperfection and iteration are two things that, that go hand in hand. The ability, we know here largely from tech, right? We kick out a, 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 an alpha or a beta product and then we iterate on that. So the designers and the developers, they know that. Artists, which I'm about to show you, that's Macklemore there. Ben, Mac, ben Haggerty, Macklemore is a friend of mine. The thing I want to show you in just a second, I think might be surprising. You may have seen him most recently on television as winning more Grammys than anyone else including Jay-Z, including Beyonce, including the, like anyone. He won the most Grammys. This is what his music or his performance sort of sounded and looked like in 2009. Hello, everybody. A dinner party at my studio. Like a no, young I, Chuck Norris. To me, you belong to the church. I'm sorry, Matt. I like it. Um, how many people have ever had a pair of Air Jordans in their life? <laughs> yeah. One time. He's, like, um, he's nervous, for sure. I might have to look at a piece of paper. Does not look like a Grammy this? performance yeah. right there. But that's OK. That's OK. He's going to read his song <laughs> off a piece of paper. <laughs> um, it goes like, make the money. Don't let the money make you. Change the game, but don't let the game change you. To hip hop, I'll forever remain faithful. To all my people, stay true. And I said, make the money. Don't let the money make you. Change the game, don't let the game change you. To hip hop, I'll forever remain faithful. To all my people, stay true. Now, I was seven years old when I got my first pair. And I went outside. And I said, mama, this air bubble here, this is going to make me fly. I hit that court, and when I jumped, I swore that I got so high, I touched the net. Mom, I touched the net. This is the best day of my life. Yeah. Air Max is... Okay, that goes on for another four or five minutes, so I'll cut it off there. That's probably not the Macklemore you're used to seeing. That is him performing two songs that were on his album, one called Wings and one called Make the Money, in their first iteration. How uncomfortable did he look? He's pacing, kind of sweaty, looking as he wrote the lyrics on a piece of paper in case he forgot them, and he's performing them to his peers, to his tribe. That was a dinner party that I had in my studio in 2009. So he really stands for two of these top tens. He got that last one, iteration, because he's clearly iterated. That one song became two songs. Those two songs were on a the, the, the most successful album of the year. And he was clearly iterating. That was the first time he's performed it. Have you heard the song since? They don't sound anything like that. The core is there, but he iterated on them. And the same is true for creativity as it is for coding, as it is for my mom's pictures, as it is for your needlepoint. This one here, though, putting more of yourself into your work. You see, he was telling real stories. Mom, I touched the net. I touched the net once. It was a while ago, but I touched the net. And when I did, I felt that feeling. He was talking, he was bringing real personality into his People ask me all the time, how do I find my voice? That's the number one question I get asked as an artist. How do I find my voice? I don't know. You find your voice by looking in here and taking a lot of pictures. The more pictures you take, the more you'll find your voice. You find your voice by using it. Think of how an, how an animal finds its voice. A child, a baby. How does a baby find its voice? By screaming. Ah! We're like, fuck. <sighs> over and over and over. And then it starts to say, mama, can I have a cracker, and then it says, Daddy, can I borrow the car? And then it says, you know, it says a bunch of other things, but. Um, then Dad says, $20, why do you need $10? Never mind. <laughs> 
put more of you into your work. That's the number one thing that I get, the number one question I get asked, and I put it on four, down number four in my top 10 for how to tap into creativity. The next one is pretty interesting, mostly because of this awesome graphic. What is going on in your brain? If you are not doubting yourself, then you are clearly, that's a sweet mustache, that dude's from Portland, or maybe even Austin. But if you are not doubting what you're doing, if you're pushing yourselves and it doesn't feel uncomfortable, you're not doing it right. If you walk out of here, if you show someone a picture that you think is good and you show it to them and you're scared shitless, then you're doing it right. I don't even know if, I think I might not supposed to be swearing from the stage, I'm sorry. That being said, show your, when you show your work, these are things that have laddered up before us, you should feel uncomfortable, you should put it out there. Vulnerability is a really, really important part of creativity and it's a part, I think, why people don't feel like they need to run or they can run at it because they have to be, if they're doing it right, they have to put a little bit of themselves in there, they have to, they have to take a little bit of risk. I don't know if you're familiar with the artist or the scientist Stephen Kotler. There's a handful of check boxes that we can get into flow, get into the zone. Part of them is some consequences. You need, to, you need to have a little bit of risk attached to it. That's number three. Number two, make something every day. I'm not talking about a skyscraper. I'm not talking about a, a full-fledged app. I'm not talking about a meal even. Make a dish. Take a picture. Write some piece of code. Austin, how many, le how many words do you ask yourself to write every day? It varies. It varies. He's time-based, so he does something for an hour or two and a half minutes, whatever is working for him. But he does something every day. And the cool part is the science, this guy named Rex Jung from, I think, the University of New Mexico said it overtly that creativity, this is a little bit of a paraphrase, actually, that creativity creates more creativity. What's literally happening when you're making stuff is you're, you've heard of brain plasticity. Your, your brain is literally rewiring itself to be able to make better stuff next time. So I'm not talking, it doesn't matter if you work at NASA, you're a rocket scientist, you're a coder, all of these things are literally applicable to your world and you can start them immediately. Number one, this is probably a weird number one for some. Um, I don't know if you recognize those, those gentlemen. That is Steve Jobs and Johnny Ive. I've done a lot of work with Apple. I feel very fortunate to have shot some campaigns with them. I was at One Infinite Loop going in for a meeting. I'll never forget it. I walked in on my phone, and I just I pushed the, well, the doors, op pushing open, and I l almost literally bumped into someone, and that someone was Steve. Kind of speechless. I'm not really a, a star effer, but I was like, wow, that's Steve Jobs. And it's like, hi, Steve. I said, hey. He held the door for me, which is cool. I continued on my way in, and I was only a foot in, and I, was, I had my phone with me because I was texting, and I just turned around and I snapped that picture. He was dead not long after that. And so when you think about making stuff, and you think about your time on this world, or in this world, you really do have nothing to lose. So I'm gonna grab a paragraph from his speech at Stanford. Remembering that I will be dead soon is the most important tool I've ever encountered to help me make the big choices in life. Because almost everything, all external expectations, all pride, all fear of embarrassment or failure, these things just fall away in the face of death, leaving only what is truly important. Remembering that you're going to die is the very best way to avoid the trap of thinking that you have something to lose. You are already naked. There is no reason not to follow your heart. And I would say the same thing is true for making stuff. There is no reason. That, that is a fundamental difference between us and almost every other species on the planet. We have creativity in our DNA. We are built to make stuff. Don't wait too long before you start making stuff. It's an important part of life. So as I look to wrap here, that's the end of my sort of third act. I would ask you all to look around at our heroes. Look around at the Richard Bransons, the Amelia Earharts, the Martin Luther King Juniors, the Rosa Parkses. What they did was incredibly creative. Incredibly courageous, sure. 
but incredibly creative. The courage that it took to do those things, we think, oh man, that was so risky. So risky. I would actually articulate today that what they did was risky then, but it's not risky now. Dropping out of school, it was crazy for them. He dropped out of Reed. You heard that, that uh, Bill Gates dropped out of uh, Harvard. Ooh, how risky. I would bet you that it's actually more risky today to stay on the traditional path. The numbers suggest that it's more risky to stay on that path. So if we're going to solve the world's biggest problems, if we're going to solve uh, humanitarian crises, if we're going to build flying cars, if we're going to write the next app that changes the world, create the next Facebook, or just create a photo album that we're going to share with grandma, we can't sit around and wait for one Steve Jobs every generation, for one MLK Jr., for one Amelia Earhart. We have to start cultivating these people now. It's almost like growing them, like we're going to grow people. And if we are, I don't, I don't want one Steve Jobs. We don't need one Steve Jobs. We need 10,000 Steve Jobs lights. That, that, that might be a little less intense. It might be better for everybody. But there is a room full of people here that completely exemplify. One of the reasons you're here is to connect, to create, to make something, to think about what the future looks like for the rest of the world. In the arts communities, in photo, in design, in, in technology, interactive. Make 10,000 Steve Jobs lights. And hopefully, I'd like to see one of those 10,000 Steve Jobs lights be you. That's it. Thank you. This is actually where shit gets interesting in my mind, where you start asking questions. And if there are no questions, because I was pretty definitive in what I wanted to say up here, I would cry. So I don't want to cry. I would like to take some questions. And I think we've got about 15 minutes in order to do so. There's a mic right there. We can talk about anything you want. We can talk about uh, photography. We can talk about some sort of strange dance. <laughs> and you're lining up, it looks like good. So fire map me, ready? It's all yeah. you. All right, awesome. Who are, um, who are you? I'm Michelle. Where do you hail from, Michelle? I li I've lived here in Austin for 10 years. Awesome. Go local. If you guys know to know where to eat, just come find me. Raj knows what I'm talking about. Nice, what's that taco place outside of town? The, um, Torchies, yeah, I had that taco. That was amazing. All Fried right. chicken with the crazy sauce. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's, it's good. Um, I have a question. So we're talking about how once children go into junior high, they become deprogrammed for creativity. Yes. And as a parent of two young children, just kind of letting them run amok, what can I do outside of that kind of program to help them maintain their curiosity and their love of, of all of that? I wouldn't count on it happening at school. If you can influence your teacher, fantastic. But one of the things that I love is that non-traditional paths. I'm not saying school sucks, pull them out of school and homeschool everybody. That's not the solution. But you should create a format where you have those opportunities at home. And I, look, I know we all work a ton and raising kids is hard enough already. But you have to be able to say yes. You have to be able to cultivate those 10 things that I was talking about outside of the school because, and, and I encourage you to pressure the school to, to what, what programs get cut first? Arts. Arts. That sucks. And it doesn't suck because all our kids are going to grow up being painters. That's not what you should be worried about. What, what, what painting class is designed to do is not create painters. Painting class is designed to program your child's brain so that they can think freely, they can look at solutions from a different perspective and come up with something that their peers who don't paint can't come up with. So two-part answer. One, you are responsible for what happens in your own household. That's what you can change. And I suggest that you create, like literally make them do something every day and make it fun for them. Mm -hmm. There are all kinds, it's no secret, little plug here. Uh, 
I have a company called Creative Live that teaches photography, filmmaking, design, all that stuff. It's 100% free. You've heard of the Khan Academy? That teaches you science. I'm looking for them to do the same things, the same video games, all kinds of stuff that is for creativity. It's out there, and if you don't know it, I would call you lazy because it's there for the taking. It's free. You have to provide that if you want the best for your kid. Awesome. Thank you. My pleasure. Next question. Hi, Chase. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm great. I'm who, Katie. Who are you? Katie. I'm All right. I'm Katie. I'm in Austin. I followed you for a long time online. I'm a photographer also. Um, two comments. I dropped out of pursuing the arts when I was in high school because of class rank. The arts classes weren't as heavily weighted, and I wanted to go to a great school. So okay. that was just a comment. Where'd you go to school? Uh, I went to Northwestern. Where I was an econ major, which was totally boring. I didn't do anything artistic then. So, okay. um, anyway, I have the opportunity to sort of help my kids not go down that path. I Got guess, it. I would say. So, uh, A, I applaud you for helping your kids not go down that path. B, I don't blame you for making the decisions. I went to, I, I was destined for medical school and bailed on that. Then I went back into a PhD program in the philosophy of art and then quit that. So, I'm, a, I'm the world's biggest quitter. But everything that I've left for created the world that I have over here and made it possible. So quitting isn't all bad, first of all. I understand why you went to North, or why you did the things you did to go to Northwestern. I would just remind you that the data suggests that it actually will matter potentially where your child goes to school if he or she goes to a Ivy League school. Everything else is looked at as vanilla milkshake. Seriously, that's what the data suggests. So consider if, if you really are on the cusp of going to Stanford, hey, man, that might actually get you that ticket. But everything else is a part of the false narrative that we've been talking about here on the stage. So I don't want to get overly preachy. I'm a little bit freakish about this. But just, I don't want you to put so much pressure on yourself to get your kids into school and get them to the right school so they can have the right life because the right life does not equal the right school. What else you got, anything? Uh, no, I think, did I read that you lent Macklemore and Ryan Lewis a red camera to shoot their thrift shop video? Yeah, they actually asked if I could lend them one and I couldn't at the time, so I connected with them with a friend and they actually ended up buying one, so. Yeah, you did. You did. Very, very cool. Those Thank guys you. are good friends. And how about that? How about those guys? Crazy shit, right? Hi, Chase. Um, I was lucky enough to uh, be part of one of the studio audiences for a Creative Live course, and I can't speak your praises enough. Huge crush on your company and everything you're doing. Thank you. Um, my name is Renee. I'm an educator turned entrepreneur, and I've done a lot of student leadership development, and I think I'm a great educator because I've become sort of a generalist, where I'm kind of generally okay at a lot of things, yep. but what I've really found that I'm good at is advising students and helping them find their course. So the question I have for you is, um, to prevent my students from becoming generalists and really start choosing a path um, and finding a focus for that creativity, is there one, any one question or call to action that you have for those young people? I am the product of a, being a generalist. <laughs> so I guess I, I'm not sure I align with your thesis. And I think the future is people who are really good at stuff and a lot of stuff, not necessarily the people who are great at one thing. I, was t I went against all that knowledge, or all of that, that coaching. If you're gonna be the best photographer, you have to be the best. I shoot you know, weddings with brides that are 10 feet tall, and I do it only on Tuesday and at $50,000. Like, that's a specialization, right? It's a fictitious one, unless somebody, anyway. <laughs> I was told to do that. I, it, it just didn't satisfy me professionally so I didn't do it, and I literally think that that's the reason that I've had the success that I've had in photography is because I've been able, I haven't been able to be put in a particular box. I, I can't say it's for everybody, I'm, I'm a hardworking guy, but just the, the fundamental like, premise that you opened with of you don't want your kid to be a generalist, I think kids should be generalists. There's so much time for them to figure out the things that they want to do in life. I didn't figure out my shit until after college. I had to drop out of two different programs. And then I only figured it out, and I grabbed a thread, and then I pulled that thread, and I grabbed another thread. And I started Creative Live like three years ago with my friend Craig Swanson. And now, you know, it's, it's, 
it's accelerating rapidly. I can, that's one of the first things that I feel like I've really done. And I still feel young. So I don't, don't want to put you so much pressure on yourself. Did I make you feel bad there? I'm sorry. No, not at all. I think one of the hard parts is students trying to choose a major or choose a career, what they're going to do with their life, is they're so overwhelmed stop, by stop, the choices. Stop, stop, <laughs> Choosing a major is not choosing a life. I majored in dead white guys. <laughs> it's not. I, I majored in philosophy, the philosophy of dead white men. It's not a life. Don't feel like it is. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, I'm just getting warmed up. I don't know how long we can go here, but this is good. Uh, I'm Keith. I work at a design agency in Dallas. Yes. Um, I'm a developer there, and so I'm generally regarded as the least creative person in the office. I know. How? So Boo! I, You're uh, not the least creative. You're incredibly creative. Do you want, you want to send me down there? You know, knock some people. Not into really. Shape. <laughs> well, so I, I'm wondering. I, you know, I come to okay. the table with with creative ideas. I mean, I'm a photographer. I play guitar, but those are not visual design things that you know bring value to the agency. And so, I, I feel like a lot of the opinions that I have get kind of dismissed because it's like, oh, he doesn't have great taste in visual design, so that you know that's not welcome. I'm wondering how you can kind of level the playing field and say my kind of creative is different than your kind of creative. You know, and sure see eye to eye on that. Sure, I would suggest the thing you're getting credit for, or uh, discounted for, spend some time there. Like, get good at visual design on your own so that when you walk in, you can lay some shit down and they go like, damn, that that's actually good. Now, I'm not a guy who's interested in chasing and fixing all one's weaknesses. I'd rather play more to my strengths. But being able to articulate a point of view, I think just, this is a total guess. I am clairvoyant, but this is a guess <laughs> that what you actually should be working on is articulating your vision for the creative in a different way. That is what I learned in philosophy. I learned how to communicate with a really structured, clear way of speaking. And now I can totally do some jujitsu shit on those ad buyers because they don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it makes sense. Thank you. So, yeah, I, I, don't quit on me. Hold tight. Stay with me. <laughs> You are incredibly creative. Finding a way to bring your creativity to bear in a way that's recognized by your peers, that's your challenge. Your challenge isn't to go away and, and play more guitar for them. It's like, what, what do they need to recognize? And this is only if you want to play in that field. There's another option, which is totally legit, which is to say, I'm out of here, and go over here where your skills are welcomed. Yeah, totally, you can clap for that. Thing two is actually like take, the, take that as feedback and go after that. Let that be fuel for your fire, okay? I want, you to, I want you to think about how articulating your vision will actually get you the thing you want. If you went to a new design thing, you roll in, you roll in as the creative guy. I'm the most creative developer, or that's how you position yourself in your interview. I will watch it. They will look at you just by reframing your world. You can literally walk in as a completely different person to that fresh group of eyes. Try it. Cool. Thank you. Hey, Chase. My name is Army, and I dropped out of high school, actually, after the first year to be a writer and marketing consultant. How'd that go for you? Pretty damn well. It's working out. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. Praise the Lord. <laughs> No, but um, you know, one of my problems is that I have a hundred different projects that I'm working on at any moment, and That's I'm wondering, a lot. yeah, uh, how do you prioritize what you you put your energy and effort into? Survival. <laughs> I, 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 survival is a little bit of a joke, but there's a lot of truth in it. Which is, I have a, a like you, I have a lot of projects that I'm interested in. I I literally use um, time management coaching. I literally use systems. For the, for the first half of my professional life, I resisted systems like because they was from the man. I'm the creative. They were trying to keep me down. I need to beat a Wednesday meeting. I'm not going to have any good ideas on Wednesday. It wasn't that bad. I wasn't an asshole about it. But what I did do is I found a way to put some structure into my life because structure often had to take off. But he uses a really, really structured way of living so that he, when he's, he's um, 
and there's a, a lot of repetition. He sits down at his computer at the same time every day, and that works for some people. But I would, it's surprising how much a framework actually frees up your mind to be more creative. Remember that space thing I was talking about? I wasn't talking about space. I wasn't talking about sitting in the middle of a basketball. I was thinking about emotional space. So structure your life a little bit in a way. And this is things that if creatives, they just generally revolt. But structure enough of your life such that you can have some time and when you have that time, that helps you prioritize. And when you are able to prioritize and you still have more time, then you can execute on the things that actually matter. That's the wisdom, is finding out what's going to matter. Everything else is fine. A couple times in my life, I had 17,000 email messages in my inbox. I went, Deep. deleted all of them. You know what happened? Nothing. Serious as a heart attack. I'm not even kidding. So put some structure in your life. Think of a way that, of organizing things that can give you more time and space in a way that you don't already have them. I'm, help, I'm banking that that's going to help you with prioritization. Thank you, Chase. You're welcome. Keep them coming. Hey, Chase. Hi. My name is Jen Sherby, and I'm from Toronto, and I work in marketing. Awesome. And my question is, uh, could you share your thoughts on effective brainstorming? And why I ask is basically your point about number nine yeah. and how it's important to take space. Yeah. So is it a good idea to throw people in a room together and make them bounce ideas off of each other in like a limited period of time, or should they take breaks? They should take an improv comedy class first, because what improv comedy makes you do is makes you say yes and. Mm -hmm. Instead of, we could do a purple gorilla, and someone's like, no. It should, be, it should be yes, and we can also do a red giraffe. So yes, and there's some really fundamental principles of, of improv comedy or even improv acting that are super powerful. Just That would be a fun office exercise if you had someone come in and teach improv comedy. You'll watch your brainstorming sessions go way up. I'm not a huge fan of meetings. Just generally, I don't like meetings. But I love, broad, uh, I love brainstorming if there are some constraints around it, like saying yes, and. That's also. I don't want to just say that everything is a good idea because you got to be. It's okay to say no, but. But that's a different part of the meeting. Then you go through and you look at all the ideas and you just decide based on the rubric which is going to be the best one for what thing. So your your question is 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 brainstorming a good exercise? Yes, I love to brainstorm. I like it in small, intense doses, and then I like to go away. That's the. Work hard, come to South by Southwest, party your brains out, meet a bunch of crazy people. Four or five of those people are going to stick. Everyone else is going to be a blur. And then when you go home, you look at those four or five business cards that are people that were really meaningful and you had a meaningful interaction or can help you or you can help and do something about those. Same exact thing with the brainstorm. Thank you. Yep. Yo. Hello. Uh, my name is Tarek. I'm an art director, so I'm always asked to be creative. Uh, oh. And actually, my question is pretty complimentary to the last one. Okay. Uh, I find that I'm actually more creative when I'm working with someone else. Mm -hmm. um, and but the way, and you can address this if this is something that you've actually dealt with. Yep. They think creative is something that you do by yourself. It's not. Right. So is there? Can you talk a little bit about that? Like, how do you I say, okay, I am creative, but yep. I would like to work with someone else. Uh, and usually there's not. Uh, Who's the they that you're worried oh, about? Oh, usually the producers. You know, people paying for the for the for the service. Got it. Of, so th do it on your own, and do it in a place where they're not watching you, and then just come in with the kick-ass ideas. Okay. <laughs> you guys, I feel sad to say that my time is up. I got someone throwing stuff at me. My monitor's going like this. I haven't looked at it in five minutes and six seconds. They're pissed. I'm. <laughs> I'm so grateful that there's still a long line. I'm going to be side stage here, or should I should should I leave the room? There, yeah, there's one. I will walk straight to the back of the room and step outside, and I would love to talk to as many of you as want to talk to me. I will be the last man standing, I promise. Fair? Thank you, guys. Yeah.